On behalf of the Evangelism Committee, I'd like to welcome everybody here this afternoon. I'd like to thank any visitors that are here with us for coming and sharing in your support of Christian education. And I'd really like to thank the congregation for their support for all the work of the Evangelism Committee. Let's call upon God's name in prayer. O most merciful God and Heavenly Father, Thou who art the Almighty, Sovereign God of heaven and earth, the only God and true God, Thou who dost uphold and sustain us and dost watch over us, not a hair can fall from our head without Thy will. Lord, we come, on, come before Thee, thanking and praising Thy most holy name. We thank Thee for the many blessings that Thou hast graciously bestowed upon us. We pray that Thou wilt work mightily in our hearts with thy spirit that we use these gifts to thy name's honor and glory and that we are good stewards of them we pray that thou wilt be with us as a congregation and as parents in the task that thou hast given us of raising thy covenant youth help us always to remember that they are not our children they are thine and thou hast entrusted them to us we pray for strength and wisdom and to put our cares upon thee and to trust in thee for guidance in this calling. Wilt thou be with us in this afternoon hour? We pray that thou wilt watch over us, keep us from sin. Lord, we are sorry for our sins and ask repentance, from, ask forgiveness from them. Wilt thou blot them out in Christ's blood? All this we pray, not because we are worthy of it, but alone for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'd like to read Psalm 78. We'll read the first 11 verses of Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from, our, from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Our speaker today is Prof. Dykstra. He is a professor of church history and New Testament studies at the Protestant Reformed Theological Seminary in Granville, Michigan. Thank you, Casey, for your introduction. If you cannot read that very well, then I gotta warn you, you really need to sit closer to the front because this, uh, this is not just wall decoration. There will be a lot of quotations that you will want to read and you will not be able to read them very well if you can't read this. So we are most welcome to move up a little closer to the front. I want to thank Hope Protestant Reformed Church for inviting me to come to sunny California the weather and the mountains are a welcome sight to me. And more importantly, I am grateful because of the opportunity to address you today on the topic that we have before us. The topic combines two things that are very dear to my heart. As a teacher of church history, the Reformation period is like unto none other. It's beautiful, it's inspiring, it's tremendously significant for us. And then besides that, Christian education, my background was in Christian, edu Christian education before coming to the ministry, and I have a deep love for that as well. This brings the two together. 
And I surely appreciate your attendance here on this beautiful day that you would come out on a Saturday and especially to see the children and see them come and, and listen to this and behold what God has done to you in the matter of the Reformation and Christian education. The quotation which I have up on the screen from Martin Luther has become really a theme for me in the studies that I have done on the matter of Christian education. When schools prosper, the church remains righteous and her doctrine pure. Young pupils and students are the seed and source of the church. If we were dead, whence should come our successors, if not from the schools? For the sake of the church, we must have and maintain Christian schools. I don't think he's overstating it. For the sake of the church, not for the church maybe right at any given moment, but when you look at the future of the church, we must have and must maintain Christian schools. Today my goal is threefold. Three things that I want to demonstrate for you from the history of the Reformation and her emphasis on Christian education. First of all, that the Church of God, especially the Reformation churches, hold Christian schools in the very highest regard. They consider them to be extremely important. I want to demonstrate that, first of all. Secondly, why did they consider them to be so important? That's, a, that's something for us to know, too. We have to understand why are they important? Why did they think Christian schools were important? And thirdly, I want to demonstrate what is it about Christian schools that makes them so very important for the church today. I could show you a fourth thing, and I really wish I could, but we don't nearly have that much time, and that is that the Christian education, even schools, have been something that the church has done from the Old Testament on. This is what the church does. The church establishes and maintains her own schools. If you want to fly me back sometime, we'll have many more lectures on this, and I'll be glad to discuss this topic. It is, it is really significant to me that the church has always established her own schools, even going back into the Old Testament, not way at the beginning of the Old Testament, but from the end of the Old Testament on, the church had her own schools. This is emphatically a reformed heritage, a reformed heritage. That Christian reformed and Canadian reformed and Protestant reformed people have had their own schools is not coincidence. This is something that is due to the fact that they are reformed churches. This is what the reformed church has emphasized, the need for churches to have their own Christian schools. The path that we will take, as I want to show you those three things in particular, the path that we will take, first of all, I want to briefly to look at the Protestant Reformed Churches and her emphasis on Christian schools. And then secondly, to trace that back. We want to trace that back even to the Netherlands, because that's where it, our roots go as Protestant Reformed Churches and most Reformed Churches trace their roots back to the Netherlands. And then, thirdly, to return to America, to see how the zeal of the Netherlands came to America in the Christian Reformed churches and then to us. And then finally, I want to back up one more time and go to the Reformation, to Luther, and show that Luther and Calvin and the other reformers were zealous for reformed, for, re for Christian education, particularly the second and third goal. So remember our three goals then. Our three goals is that the Church of God, especially the Reformation churches, believe, have always believed that Christian education is important. Secondly, why they consider them to be important. Oops, I'm moving on too quickly. And about what, what about Christian schools makes them so important. Let's begin then with the Protestant Reformed churches and the zeal that we have for that. In the first place, it's evident officially officially in our church documents that we maintain, you can see the importance of the Christian school. First, in the church order, Article 21, it reads this way, the consistory shall see to it that there are good Christian schools 
in which the parents have their children instructed according to the demands of the covenant. That's right in our rules that govern our churches. The consistories must see to it that there are good Christian schools for the children of the church. And then Article 41, at every meeting of the classes, in classes west in September and in March, at each meeting, the president shall, among other things, put the following questions to the delegates of each church, and every church in the classes must answer this question, among others, are the poor and the Christian schools cared for? Yes or no, are they cared for? That's not all. Officially, every year, the church has a visitation from the men appointed by classes, and among the questions that are put to the consistory is this. The consistory is asked, does the consistory see to it that the parents send their children to the Christian schools? Officially speaking, the churches, the Protestant Reformed churches, clearly are committed to Christian schools. That's not merely on the books. That's not merely in documents. This is also something that's found in the heart and in the lives of the members of the Protestant Reformed churches. By God's grace, and I can't stress that enough, this is humbling. There's no pride here. By the grace of God, Protestant Reformed churches establish and maintain 13 grade schools and four high schools. We're not a very large denomination. 31 churches or so, 8,000 people, many of which are children. But of those, of those churches, 13 grade schools and four high schools are maintained. Every year, to give you an idea of the commitment, every year to keep those schools running, the, the members of the Protestant Reformed churches must raise over $10 million. $10 million. That's, that has nothing to do with the church budget. That doesn't even include the school building. If you want to have a school building, you need to raise money in addition to that. I'm just talking about the budgets, paying the teachers, paying the electricity, buying the books. $10 million a year. That's astounding. That shows you the commitment that Protestant Reformed people have to the Christian school. The history of the Christian schools, very briefly, the churches were organized in 1925. Most of them at that time used the existing Christian Reformed schools. There were many of them, and they continued to use them. The very first Protestant Reformed school was, as most of you know, right here in Redlands, California, the very first one in 1934. The second one was in Walker, Hope in Walker, and Edgerton Free Christian School in 1950, the third. And you say, well, why did they organize their own schools? And, and it wasn't really that they were saying, well, we just don't like the schools that we have. That really wasn't it. It was positive. And the reason is they wanted consistent teaching, teaching that would be consistent what the children were learning in the home and in the church and in the school. They wanted the same truth to be taught in all three spheres of the children's lives. This commitment that is found in the Protestant Reformed Church did not originate with, originate with the PRC. It isn't that we started this. In fact, it can be traced to a zeal in the mother church, the Christian Reformed Church, and back farther to the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. And that's why we're going to go next to the Netherlands and see where does this come from, this zeal for Christian schools. So we go to the Netherlands and we want to spend a little bit of time there on the Reformation to see where it comes from and see the connection between the Reformation and the zeal for Christian schools. The Lutheran Reformation, of course, is in Germany. If you look at the map, you'll see that there's a long border connecting Germany with the Netherlands. And keep in mind, too, that the Netherlands and Belgium were all one country at this time. So it's all one part, one group of, of provinces that are called the Lowlands, because, as all you children know, they were below the sea, right? They had to build dikes around them. They're called the Lowlands, or the Netherlands, which means Lowlands. But then notice also that the bottom of that, Belgium, which was part of the lowlands, is bordering France. 
This will have a tremendous impact on the Reformation in the Netherlands. In the first place, the Reformation there came from Germany. And it was very easily transferable to, from Germany to the Netherlands because the language of German, German language and the Netherlands language, Dutch, are quite similar. So to translate Luther's works into Dutch was relatively easy. And there were people that knew German in, in the Netherlands. So his writings came into the Netherlands. In fact, the first two martyrs, the first two martyrs that we know of for the Reformation were monks in the Netherlands who had adopted the teaching of Martin Luther. But that wasn't where it, it ended. It quickly, the teachings of Kelvin spread from Switzerland. He was French, of course, and wrote in the French, and into France, and then up into the Netherlands. And really, the people of the Netherlands adopted Calvinism more than they adopted Lutheranism. It started with Luther's teaching, but very quickly, the teaching of Kelvin took over there. Well, very early also in the Reformation in the Netherlands, there was an interest in the Christian school. In the Middle Ages, first of all, in the providence of God, the people of the Netherlands were higher, of a higher literacy rate than most of the countries in Europe. And that's one of the reasons that explained why the Reformation could spread so quickly there. Many people, many people could read the pamphlets that Luther's group published. The Reformation in the, in the 1500s, the, the, the existing Roman Catholic schools were given then to the Reformed churches. The schools that were there were Roman Catholic. Roman Catholicism was, was overcome by the Reformation, and in those areas the government gave the schools to the churches. The churches then supplied the teachers for the schools by 1586, the Senate of the Reformed Churches adopted the following as one of their decisions. Consistories everywhere shall see to it that there are good schoolmasters. You children know that a schoolmaster is simply a teacher, all right? So this, the church is saying we need good teachers, good schoolmasters, not only to teach the children reading, writing, and languages and the liberal arts, but also to instruct them in godliness and in the catechism. We need good school teachers to teach these things. And this became part of the official church order of the Re Reformation Church, the Reformed Churches in the Netherlands in 1618-19 when they adopted the church order of Dort. This became Article 21. The great Senate of Dort in 1618-19, we all know, of course, that their main calling was to deal with Arminianism. And so they adopted these doctrinal statements called the Canons of Dort. They, they did a lot of other things, though. One of the things they did was to draft a church order, as we pointed out. And then they also adopted confessions, officially adopting written forms of the confessions. But one additional thing that we're not perhaps so aware of, and that is a number of decisions were made by the Senate of Dort about Christian schools. At the Senate of Dort, they said this about the training of the youth. In order that the Christian youth may be diligently instructed in the principles of religion and be trained in piety, three modes of catechizing should be employed. We want our children to be well instructed. What must be used for that? Well, first of all, in the house, the parents must instruct their children. Secondly, in the schools by schoolmasters, again, teachers, and in the churches by ministers, elders, and catechists. Very concerned was the Senate of Dort for the children of the church, that they be instructed, well instructed, home, church, and school would be employed. Dort emphasized, as the Reformed Church always does, the responsibility of parents. Notice what Dort said. The office of parents is diligently to instruct their children and their whole household in the principles of the Christian religion in a manner adapted to their respective capacities. So according to their age, if they're older, they get harder things to be taught to them. If they're younger, they get things that are easier. 
earnestly and carefully to admonish them in the cultivation of true piety, to engage their punctual attendance on family worship, daily devotions around the word of God, and to take them with them in the hearing of the word of God. Parental responsibility was maintained. But, said Dort, we need schools. We need to establish schools. This is what, what Dort said. Schools in which the young shall be properly instructed and the principles of Christian doctrine shall be instituted not only in cities, but also in towns and country places where heretofore none have existed. The Christian magistracy, shall, that's the government now, shall be requested that well-qualified persons may be employed and enabled to devote themselves to the service, especially that the children of the poor may be gratuitously, that is, free, freely instructed, and not be excluded from the benefit of the schools. So we need schools. We need schools everywhere. Formerly, you might find many schools in the cities, but in the smaller towns, out in the countryside, there would be no schools. We need schools that will provide an education for all the children, not merely the rich, but the poor as well. We need schools for all our children, said the Synod of Dort. But if you're going to have a school, you must have good, reformed teachers, and Dort recognized that. We don't merely want school buildings, we want schools. Christian schools, and therefore that depends on the teacher. So they said, in this office, none shall be employed, but such as are, first of all, members of the Reformed Church. There was only one Reformed Church at that time, so they're talking about membership in that church. And then secondly, they must have certificates of an upright faith and pious life. The consistory of that teacher must write, give a certificate that says this teacher is upright in walk and life. And then thirdly, they must be well versed in the truths of the catechism. The teachers must be qualified. Not only that, one more thing they had. All our office bearers in the Protestant Reformed churches must sign a certificate that says they agree with the three forms of unity, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgian Confession, and the Canons of Dort. We agree with them, and we promise that we defend those and maintain those confessions. Well, in this day, Dort said, teachers in the school must sign a piece of paper that says they agree with the confessions, and they will teach in harmony with the confessions. So important that they be good, reformed teachers. Well, so we want schools for all our children. We want good, reformed teachers. But now that's not quite enough yet. Who will oversee these teachers? Who will make sure that they're doing a good job? Not merely that they're reformed, but that they're good teachers. Good teachers. Dort made provision for that too. The oversight of teachers and the students would be especially the calling of the consistory. Said Dort this, It is the duty of the ministers with an elder and, if necessary, with a magistrate to visit all the schools frequently in order to excite the teachers to earnest diligence, to encourage and counsel them in the duty of catechizing, and to furnish an example by questioning them, and that's now the, the students, questioning the students, addressing them in a friendly and affectionate manner, and exciting them to early piety and diligence. We need schools. We need good reformed school teachers. We need good reformed teachers who will do a good job in the school. And the consistory, the elders, and the minister, and even the the government must see to it that they are doing the work that they were hired to do. So the relationships that exist here in the Netherlands are as follows. First of all, the parents are emphatically said, entrusted with the responsibility. God has given you the children. You have the responsibility for those children. Never is that taken away. But secondly, the schools were financed by the government. The government gave them the buildings. The government gave them the money to pay for 
this yearly education. And then thirdly, the teachers and the content of the instruction would be supervised by the church. They had everything covered, but there was a problem. The last two items there are an issue. They're a bad relationship. At first it might seem as though everything, this should go perfect. This is exactly the way it should go, but you can see perhaps that there are problems. Wrong relationships mean that troubles will arise. First of all, government financial support means government control. It always means that. No matter how they may say, go ahead, spend it as you wish, government money means government control. In 1618, that didn't seem like much of a problem. The government was very friendly to the Reformed churches and said, go ahead, you take care of the content of the instruction, you take care of the teachers, we'll, we won't bother you. But over time, they were not so friendly. Second problem is that if the churches apostatize, then the schools will automatically go with them because they, schools are being overseen by the consistories. If the consistories apostatize, lose the truth, the schools will go downhill with them. And in fact, that's what happened. Apostasy in the church. Over the next 200 years after Dort, the churches apostatized. 200 years after Dort, we have astounding things. Ministers are teaching, contrary to the confessions, cardinal errors, errors against the cardinal important truths of the confessions, such as the Trinity. They were allowed to deny the Trinity. They were allowed to deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and still remain reformed ministers. Not only that, but the church has replaced the psalm singing with hundreds of hymns, many of them terrible hymns, Arminian hymns, totally man-centered hymns, naturalistic hymns concerning the creation. The ministers who protested these things were put under discipline. Things were not looking good. God, however, in his mercy to the church in the Netherlands gave a reformation. The Reformation of 1834, God reformed his church in something called the Ofsgeiting in the Dutch or the secession. The secession where the people seceded from the reformed church of the Netherlands. Remember that was the only church. And some of these names you may be familiar, leading ministers who came out of the reformed churches, de Kock and Skolta and Van Rolte and Brummelkamp. These men led many people out. The people that came out with them were, for the most part, the poor of the churches, extremely poor. They suffered tremendous persecution at the hand of the authorities and the hand of the Reformed Church in that day. They came out and established their own churches. But one of the things they are keenly aware of and, and very much concerned about is their own children. Their own children. Where would they go to school? The schools that they were in had departed entirely from the Reformed faith and even from basic Christianity, as we'll see here in a moment. In fact, because of the tremendous concern over the schools, there was pressure to leave the Netherlands to emigrate where they could establish because the government was not allowing them to establish their own schools. These were persecuted people who could not even have a worship service without having the government come in and break it up. They could no way establish their own schools. In a pamphlet that was written to promote immigration, entitled Immigration, Why We Favor Immigration to North America and Not to Java, Brummelkamp and Van Rolte stated this, one of the reasons why we want to emigrate to America is that we may enjoy that great privilege of seeing our children instructed in Christian schools, a privilege that we lack here. Since in the public schools, a general moral instruction is given which offend neither Jew nor Romanist, while free schools, and understand by that our own private Christian schools, are barred. 
This was a factor in the immigration to America. And that's why we're going back to America now to follow this group of people so concerned for their children and for their schools that they would actually, one of the reasons for leaving was to establish their own schools. Ben Ralty, of course, is the man who led the, the movement to the west part of Michigan. We look at a Dutch colony there on the shores of Lake Michigan. As they settled there in western Michigan, they built a city, and of course they named it Holland, right? What else would you name a, a city if you're coming from the Netherlands? Holland. And they built some schools there. But they were so incredibly poor that when Ralty knew there's no way in the world we will be able to finance our own schools. So they took government money to establish the schools. They could hire the teachers. They hired Christian teachers. They could buy their own books. They bought Dutch books from the, from the old country. Reformed textbooks for their children. They were supported by the Dutch. Almost all the parents, or, or the majority, the great majority of the people in Holland were Dutch people, and yet they were government schools. Again, you can be very critical of them. Didn't you just leave the Netherlands where you had all kinds of trouble with the government supporting the school? But I can at least sympathize with something that we can't even imagine. Namely, I really don't know if my family and I will be able to live through the winter. I do not know if we will have enough food to live through the winter. That's how poor they were. I can sympathize at least with the difficulty of establishing their own school. So they took the government money, they ran it, Van Ralty was not only the minister, he was the superintendent of the schools. He controlled the schools, so everything seems to be perfect. They have their own schools, the government's giving them money, they're paying some taxes that are also supporting it, they're running it, they're the school board, they hire their own teachers. It's their schools. Perhaps you also know that they joined the Reformed Church in America. As a classist, classist Holland joined the Reformed Church in America. That's in the providence of God because God had in mind that there would be a secession from them. And the trouble arose in 1857 and four churches separated themselves from Van Ralty. A number of things. Mainly they were concerned about the spiritual shape of the RCA, the Reformed Churches in America. These churches would eventually call themselves the Christian Reformed Church. So then let's look at that. The, the, how, did, how did the Christian Reformed Church differ from Van Ralty's group and from the RCA in general as far as how to look at Christian education? The CRC overall was zealous for Christian schools. The Grand Rapids Church, which had left Van Ralty and, and became part of the Christian Reformed Church eventually, had had its own school from the very beginning. Up in, the, in their own church building, they had a church school that they had for their children. Other consistories soon took up the cause, and in fact, in 1870, the minutes of the Second Synod of the CRC recorded this. The whole gathering was convinced that the primary school is the nursery of and for the church, and that it is therefore the calling as much as possible to attend to it that they get a free school, that is, a separate school, not a state school, but their own Christian school. That's what they mean by a free school. The churches, the Senate said, it's this important. We must strive to have our own schools. The support for them continued. In 1875, by that time, five years later, five churches had their own schools. Senate in, in 19, rather 1898 adopted this motion. Not generally, but definitively reformed instruction is requisite 
absolutely required for our children. The recognition of the need of regeneration and the recognition of the covenant relation wherein God has placed our children are the principles from which their instruction should proceed. They need covenantal, reformed instruction. The need of such instruction is earnestly urged upon all our members and upon but especially upon our, all our consistories. I call attention to the fact that this is the first time that the Senate says the members of the churches need to be involved in this. Prior to this, always the Senate said the consistories have to get busy on this. The consistories have to see to it. Now it says, yes, the consistories have a work, but the members have an obligation to form their own schools for their children. This is a significant point. A new relationship is developing. I can't go into it all. It comes out of the Netherlands and Abraham Kuyper, who actually had a, a huge hand in this, a new relationship. Initially, we saw that the schools were under the consistories, but by the late 1900s, the control shifted to societies that were formed by parents, grandparents, and other members of the congregation. Societies are being formed so that they are establishing, maintaining, governing the schools, not the consistories. Used to be the consistories would decide how much the teacher got paid. Which the, who would be the teacher? They hired and fired the teacher. The consistory did that. By the end of the 1900s, it shifted to a parental kind of school, not a state school, not a parochial school, church school, but parental schools. Thus, when a church order was adopted, and a, when a new church order, when they moved it into English and they revised a few things, Article 21, which remember said that the consistory shall see to it that there are good school masters, teachers, the new church order reads, as we have it today, the consistory shall see to it that there are good Christian schools. The consistories have an obligation. But it's that the parents are the ones who are responsible to establish these schools and maintain them for their children. And that would lead to increased activity within the CRC. A CRC historian records that in 1922, there were 75 free Christian primary schools of our people in at least 15 states of our union besides Canada, enrolling 11,000 pupils taught by 300 teachers at an annual expense in 1932 dollars of 2,275 thousand dollars. Thus far what we have looked at is the importance of Christian schools in the Protestant Reformed churches, then the Netherlands and looking at first the state control and the state schools which were controlled by the churches and then the secession churches and their desire for their own Christian school and now we came to America and looked at the Christian Reformed Church and its emphasis on Christian education. So obviously there is a, there's an importance here, but my question is, is this just a Dutch thing? What we've looked at so far is, is Dutch people who are seeing the need for instruction of their children. Is, is that all this is? Is that the Dutch see this and, and other people do not? My answer is absolutely that's not the case, that it's merely a Dutch thing. But this is, in, in fact, a Reformation zeal for Christian education that comes out of men like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Knox. And, and I can make the list far longer down here to the floor of reformers who saw the importance of Christian education for the children in the Reformation. Why was it that the Reformation was so zealous for Christian schools? Let me give you four reasons. In the first place, they were a people of the book. The Reformation, churches, were a people of the book. And that started out with the fact that they wanted to read Luther. But of course, the book is the Bible. 
And, and the people wanted everyone in the church to be able to pick up the Bible and read the Bible. Well, to do that, you have to go to school to read and to write. Secondly, the Reformation emphasized the truth of the priesthood of all believers. By that they meant, one of the things they meant is that all believers can understand the Bible. They can understand the Bible. Oops, going too far here. I think. I can't see what I've got. They can understand the Bible, and if they are going to understand the Bible, you want them to be able to use their minds. So a Christian school then will help develop develop the minds of these children so they can pick up the Bible, understand it, interpret it for themselves. Not be dependent on a minister, not be dependent on a theological professor, but be able to read the Bible and understand it themselves. Third, they saw the need for preachers. They saw the need for theological professors in the, in the seminaries. And so they said, where were these Ministers and professors come from from our children. Therefore, they need to be instructed in order for them to be to fill those roles. A fourth reason is God's covenant. But understand that this is not a pressing reason yet. They have an idea of the responsibility that they have toward their children, but the doctrine of the covenant is not something well formed. It develops during the time of the Reformation. They will become increasingly aware of the demands of the covenant, but at this point, it's not an overriding concern. It's there, but it's coming. Understand the background then of the Reformation. First of all, the, the Middle Ages before the Reformation is called the Dark Ages. It's called the Dark Ages, and that's largely because of the lack of education in the Middle Ages. It was a church-controlled education throughout the Middle Ages, every, everything from 500 up to the Reformation, 1500, so about a thousand years where the church was controlling it. They had monasteries where the monks and nuns would instruct the children. They had cathedral schools, which were especially for men to be trained to be priests. But this generally was a poor quality education. Even many of the priests were illiterate. Can you imagine that? That your own minister cannot read. That's how bad it often was in the Middle Ages. The minister could not read or right. And the instruction, because it was a Roman Catholic instruction, was it was steeped in error that these children had to learn. Enter Martin Luther. We all recognize Martin Luther's role in the Reformation as the one who led the way in doctrinal reform, but perhaps it's not as well known to us the tremendous role he played in Christian education. An expert on this, a man by the name of Dr. Painter, wrote a couple of beautiful books many years ago on education in the Reformation and Martin Luther on education in the Reformation. Wonderful books. I urge you to read them. He said this, Luther deserves henceforth to be recognized as the greatest, if not only of religious, but of educational reformers. Luther was broad-minded, he was far-sighted, and he had a tremendous impact on Christian education. It was needed. We saw that the schools of the, of the Middle Ages were poor quality, and sad to say, with the coming of the Reformation, things would actually get worse. They would get worse. Why would there be more decline in the Christian school, in the schools of the Middle Ages? Well, in the first place, finances were always a concern. Prior to the Reformation, there were merchants who had their own schools. But with the coming of the Reformation, they decided that they were not going to finance those schools very much. And besides that, the other main support of the Christian school was the Roman Catholic Church. Well, where Rome was driven out in areas of France or Switzerland or the Netherlands or Germany, there was no support for the schools. Who will pay for the schools? Besides that, Luther and Melanchthon were very critical of the existing schools. Listen to one of the things Luther wrote about the schools where he went to school. This is what he had to say. 
Was it not a burning shame that formerly a boy must needs study 20 years or longer only to learn a jargon of bad Latin and then to turn priest and say mass? And he who finally arrived at this pinnacle of his hopes, this is how high he hoped to be, a, pro, a priest who could say mass, he was accounted happy. But for all this, he remained a poor, illiterate man all his days and was neither good to cluck nor to lay eggs. Such are the teachers and guides that we have had to put up with who knew nothing themselves. And accordingly, we're unable to teach anything that was either good or true. This is the way he described the schools. You want to send your children there? Why bother? If this is the state of the school, why send your children to such a school? That's why I said with the Reformation came more decline. First of all, finances. Secondly, the, the criticisms that Luther and Melanchthon had of the existing schools. But there's a third thing, and that is that within the Reformation, there developed among some an anti-intellectual spirit. An anti-intellectual spirit. This came from some men by the name of Karlstadt and the and the Zwickau prophets who came to Wittenberg, and when Luther was gone for 11 months, hid away in the castle, these men came into Wittenberg and took over. They're called the Zwickau prophets because they said, we get special revelation from God. And that's really all you need. You don't need an education. If you want to know what the Bible says, you just pray to God and he'll give you the understanding. He'll give you special revelations even. They closed the schools in Wittenberg. Turn the main school into a bakery. You don't need schooling. You don't need instruction. We're all priests. We can all understand the Bible. An anti-intellectual spirit. The parents also shared much of these sentiments, as we will see in a moment. Luther, rather, Erasmus wrote this. Where Lutheranism reigns, knowledge perishes. There was enough truth in that statement to bite. The enrollment in universities plummeted in Germany. There were places that had student enrollment of some 300 or so, and they, they went down to 25 students. Why go to school? Anti-intellectual spirit. However, that's not Luther. That's not Melanchthon. The reformers were highly educated men. They absolutely were. They understood the value of education for the church and for society. And they began to promote Christian schools in their writing, their preaching, and when possible, their own labors. They very much supported them. And their efforts would result in two significant changes. Two significant changes. One, notable improvements in the quality of the education and secondly, making education possible for all, not merely a small group of boys that would receive instruction, but instruction for all, even the lowest classes in society. Luther faced two important hurdles as he's trying to encourage Christian education. The first is a serious lack of schools and teachers. The monasteries were closed. The cathedral schools obviously would not be appropriate for his schools. Germany needed schools and Germany needed good teachers. So Luther, in response to that, wrote something entitled to the councilmen of all cities in Germany that they establish and maintain Christian schools. He could see that the parents did not have the finances, they did not have the interest. You, the rulers, must put up the schools. This was the only way that it could happen, is if the, the governments established the schools. Now remember, he's writing to rulers who were themselves members of the Lutheran church, of his churches. And he's saying, you have a responsibility to establish schools for the people. The second problem is that parents did not want to send their children to school. They didn't see the value of education. They thought it was a waste of money. They thought in terms of utility. Boys should learn a trade and they should earn money. That's all they have to do. 
Just help me on the farm, help me in my business. You don't need an education to be able to farm, to be able to work in the shop. I'll teach you what you need to know, and that's what you need to know for life. That's how parents were looking at it. In response to that, Luther wrote something called a sermon on keeping children in school. Let's look at that first of all. Luther's sermon on keeping children in school he said in a letter to a certain Spengler, I have composed a sermon to the preachers here and there to the effect that they should exhort people to keep their children in school. For this reason, he said, I hope that the citizens will recognize the fidelity and love of their lords, the rulers now, and help earnestly to support this work by keeping their children in school, since without cost to themselves, their children are so bountifully and diligently cared for with everything provided for them. He continued, this will happen. This will happen only if the preachers get behind it. If they do not urge it, the common man will be set be beset and overcome by thoughts from Satan, and he will easily give up. Other responsibilities will keep him from thinking the matter through as a preacher can and seeing how important it is or how much is to be gained or lost. If your preacher is supporting the cause of Christian education, he is doing exactly what Martin Luther said he must do. And I heartily agree. That's his calling. But then Luther added something very important. Since people do not always understand the importance of Christian education, he said, for this reason, this is why we must be patient with such people who do not understand it as long as they are not obdurate or wicked. In any Christian school movement that I have ever examined or heard of, it is always a, a process. There are people who are gung-ho for a Christian school. There are people who are not so convinced. There's always that struggle. Luther recognizes that. He says, we must be patient. We must be patient with those who cannot yet see the need. As long as they're not being just plain wicked about it, stubborn about it, we must be patient. We must work with each other and work to have a unified Movement doesn't mean everybody has to be on board, but we must be patient. The worst thing in the world is when people become impatient and say, well, you must not care about the Protestant Reformed truth. You must not care about the children if you don't want your own school. We may never talk that way. Never. We must be patient and try to work together toward this high goal. Luther recognized it. We must as well. To the ministers, on Satan's wiles, he had this to say. Among his wiles, one of the very greatest, if not the greatest of all, is this. He deludes and deceives the common people so that they are not willing to keep their children in school or expose them to instruction. He puts into their minds the dastardly notion that because monkery, nunning, and priestcraft no longer hold out the hope they once did, there is therefore no more need for study or for learned men. That instead, we need to give thought only to know to how to make a living and get rich. Ministers, you must recognize that's a tool of Satan to turn our people away from the need for education. This, he goes on to say, this seems to me to be a real masterpiece of the devil's art. He sees that in our time, he cannot do what he would like to do. Therefore, he intends to have his own way with our offspring. Before our very eyes, he is preparing them so that they will learn nothing and know nothing. 
Then when we are dead, he will have before him a naked, bare, defenseless people with whom he can do as he pleases. You understand what he's saying? How important knowledge is for the children to be able to stand for the cause of the truth over against the attacks of Satan. So what did they hope that the schools would accomplish? And what should we expect then from a Christian school? Luther said we need schools for a lot of reasons. And this is one of the things he said. I've written much about the schools urging firmness and diligence in caring for them. The school must supply the church with persons who can be made preachers, pastors, and rulers in addition to other people needed throughout the world, such as chancellors, counselors, secretaries, and the like men who can also lend a hand with the temporal government. Yes, we need preachers, we need people in the church, but we also need people in the government of the land to rule well. They need an education. Concerning him, Luther and the preachers, he said the schools must be second in importance only to the church. For in them, young preachers and pastors are trained, and from them emerge those who replace the ones who die. But not merely preachers. Yes, preachers are important, but that's not the only reason. By what I have said, I do not want to insist that every man must train his child for this office, for not all boys must become pastors, preachers, and schoolmasters. Beside them, indeed, other boys ought also to study, even though they are not so clever, and ought to learn to understand, write, and read Latin. Good schools are necessary for good citizens, to be good citizens. He writes, now if there are no, good, no need at all for schools and languages for the sake of Scripture and of God, this one consideration alone would be sufficient to justify the establishment everywhere of the very best schools for both boys and girls, namely that in order to maintain its temporal estate outwardly, the world must have good and capable men and women, men able to rule well over land and people, women able to manage the household and train children and servants aright. He insisted that the instruction that would be given to the children must be for boys and girls. This is a breakthrough. This is a change in the way that the church looked at it up to this point. Above all, he said, the foremost reading for everyone, everybody, both in the universities and in the schools, should be the Holy Scriptures, both for the younger boys, the Gospels, for the younger boys, the Gospels, and would to God that every town had a girls' school as well, where the girls would be taught the Gospel for an hour every day in German or in Latin. He wanted us an education that was broad. He insisted on that. For my part, he said, if I had children and could manage it, I would have them study not only languages and history, but also singing and music together with the whole of mathematics. A prom prominent place should be given to histories in whatever languages they may be obtained, for they are wonderfully useful in understanding and regulating the course of the world and in disclosing the marvelous works of God. But whatever kind of school we put up, he said, it must be a school governed by the Bible. This is crucial. I would, he said, I would advise no one to send his child where the Holy Scriptures are not supreme. I greatly fear that the universities, unless they teach the Holy Scriptures diligently and impress on them, on the young students, are wide gates to hell. Understand he's talking about universities now where you would send your 14-year-old boy. That's when they would often go off to the university at 14 years old. And they would go to schools where they were not governed by the Holy Scriptures. And he said, I fear there are wide gates to hell. He insisted, however, on parental responsibility. God has given you children and the means to support them, not only that you may do not only that you may do with them as you please or train them for worldly glory, you have been earnestly commanded to raise them for God's service or be completely rooted out with your children and everything else. Then everything that you have spent on them will be lost if you do not teach them these important things. 
but parents need schools. Now, in the next quote that I'm going to show you, Luther makes some very, very harsh statements about parents. I wouldn't say the same thing to parents today. You have to understand he's coming out of centuries where parents were indeed very ignorant, where parents were not raising their children in the fear of the Lord. And now he's looking at the people that are in Germany and in his congregation, and he says this. In the first place, there are some parents who lack the goodness and decency to do it, even if they had the ability. In the second place, the great majority of parents, unfortunately, are wholly unfitted for this task. But then the third point is always appropriate. It takes extraordinary person to bring up children right and teach them well. In the third place, even if parents had the ability and desire to do it themselves, they would have neither the time nor the opportunity for it, what with their other duties and the care of the household. That's how Luther saw it, and I would agree. But if we will have schools, we must have good teachers. I wish, he said, that no one would be chosen preacher unless he had first kept school. I heartily agree. In a, in a city, as much depends on a schoolmaster as on a minister. We can get along without burgomasters, princes, and noblemen, but we can't do without schools, for they must rule the world. If I were not a preacher, I know no position on earth I'd rather fill than that of a schoolmaster. But one must not consider how the world esteems and rewards it, but how God thinks of it, and how will he will praise it in the day of judgment. So Luther, in summary, said, God gives parents the responsibility to instruct their children. Parents need a school to assist them. Schools must be for boys and girls. Education is to be broad. Education is to be based on the scripture. And good teachers are essential for the schools. Again, I say he was transforming the whole idea of education for children in his day. John Kelvin was a faithful follower of Martin Luther in so many ways, but also in the matter of Christian education. Very briefly, Kelvin understood the importance of, in, of instruction. In Geneva, he himself wrote a catechism for the children. He saw they needed instruction. He wrote a question and answer catechism for them. He organized a school system in the city, a grammar school for all the children, a high school for the boys that demonstrated ability, which is essentially a university, and then beyond that, a seminary for those who would be ministers and professors. Calvin's main contributions are this. One, we must give our children the kind of instruction that when they leave school, they're ready for a lifetime of learning. We're not merely concerned that they learn a lot while they are students. We want them to have the tools to continue to read and study and learn their entire lifetime. Secondly, a broad education. Luther had said it. Calvin said it even more emphatically. He pointed out that God makes himself known, especially in the scriptures, but he said, we gain knowledge of God from the study of all the areas that we study in school. We gain the knowledge of God as we look at his works in the creation. And thirdly, the goal of Christian education must be a lifetime of good works. You want to hear the instruction of Luther and Calvin brought into even sharper focus? Read the book by Professor Inglesmo that was offered to all the visitors. It's an absolute, absolutely clear presentation of these principles, the demand of Christian education. The conclusion that I come to is that the whole of the Reformation zealously supported Christian schools. The whole of the Reformation. It really doesn't matter where you turn. Whether you turn to Zwingli and Bullinger in, in Zurich 
Knox in Scotland, the Huguenot in France, the Reformed in the Netherlands, the Reformed and Presbyterian in South Africa, the Presbyterians in Australia, the Reformed in Brazil, in America and Canada, the Puritans and the Reformed, they all established their own schools. They did. They understood the importance of Christian schools. They had a zeal for it. That's what lies behind this list. Again, in the providence of God, these schools still maintained, with a lot of sacrifice, a lot of zeal, gladly we maintain them. The importance of Christian schools, it is the future. It's the future. Any church that is reformed can exist for the moment. Can exist until the reformed elders and minister are no longer. When they're gone, then up until that point, that church exists. But we're looking, you see, at the future of that church. And that's what Luther meant when he said, when schools prosper, the church remains righteous and her doctrines pure. For the sake of the church, we must have and maintain Christian schools. That's my conviction. And that, in a nutshell, is the zeal that the Reformed faith from Luther on has had for Christian education. I can only pray as I do that God will continue to give to his people throughout the world this kind of zeal for the Christian education, for the sake of the seed, and for the future of the Reformed faith. I thank you for your kind attention. Three or four have, uh, have are questions that have to do with our own, with, it, with a Reformed college. And do you think the time is right for the PR churches to start their own university? Are there serious efforts to this effort? And there's a number of questions like that. So uh, I can answer there's four of them like that. And, and my own thinking is I absolutely want it. I want it very, very badly. I want it because I want the reformed view to come through in all the different subjects. And I'm most concerned, therefore, that our teachers, our future teachers, get this kind of an education. Because to this point, as a teacher, I, I taught for four years in, a, in, in Hall, grade school. I went through our own school, so I got 13 years of Protestant informed education. I got my, my catechism, I got my instruction from my godly parents, all right. And then I go to a university, and I happen to go to a state university, because I could afford that. Well, that or another reformed institution is still not going to give me a Protestant reformed, a truly reformed world and life view. It will not. It will not give me reformed pedagogy, how to instruct children, how to discipline children. It's not. It has to come out of my experience. And I felt myself woefully inadequate to the job when I took up the work of instructing 13, 14 year old children. I felt woefully inadequate to it. And I left after four years of teaching still feeling woefully inadequate. How do I take Christ and have him come through all the courses, every course that I taught? It was a struggle for me just to get through the material, let alone to try to do that in a proper way. And if I could have had an instruction in the university that would have equipped me for that, I would have been light years ahead of where I was even at the end of four years of, of teaching. So I, I very much hope that we can at, at the very least have something to help our teachers get a grip on that area of instruction to be able to bring that into the classroom but obviously the benefits for all of our covenant youth would be immense if we could do it. That is a huge project. $10 million. Do we have another $10 million a year? 
10 million to run the schools we have. Do we have another 10 million to run a university? It's a huge, huge matter, not only financially, but getting the people to be able to, to, to teach, getting government approval may be well nigh impossible. I'm not sure about all those things. Get the standard bearer and start reading it. I hope the Lord willing to address some of these things in the next half a year or so. Some things are being done. Some things are being done. Our local, our local schools, many of them have, they're part of a federation of schools. The federation of schools, Protestant reform school boards are looking at the issue. So it's another good reason to support the federation board. They're doing something along that line. Can you put into words a distinctive approach to, or, to reformed education? The, the most important thing there, and this is a huge, this is a lecture all in itself, but the, the most important thing for me is a reformed world and life view. How do you look at God? How do you look at the world? How do you look at yourself? You have to have a reformed way of looking at the world, at God, and at yourself. There is a common grace way of looking at it, there is a thoroughly man-centered way of looking at it. We want to look at it from the point of view of a reformed teacher. The confessions and the word of God teaching us how to look at God and the world and ourselves. And that is a distinctively reformed education. Should there be more stringent mechanism by which PR school teachers are screened for their reform knowledge, zeal, and practice. I, I don't know about more stringent, but I think very much we should pay attention to the past and say to that teacher that's coming, what does your consistory say about you? Does your consistory approve of your lifestyle and, and, your, and the way that you've conducted yourself and your views as far as the reformed faith? I think that would be very appropriate. And I believe that that school boards should be very diligent in pursuing these things. And ask questions, not merely, you know, what do you think of little kids, and how, do you, how will you do this and do that? that? That's fine, but what kind of literature do you read? Do you read RFPA books? Do you read Standard Bear? What kind of things do you read? How, what are you doing to develop your soul? Not merely what, how good a teacher, absolutely that how good a teacher are you going to be but also there's this other side of the reformed faith their knowledge of it their love for it if and when the government shuts down our schools what will we do should we be as the dutch move to a country that allows christian schools well in the day that the government shuts down our schools i don't know there will be another country we could move to this is one of the freest lands in all the world when they shut down our schools, I doubt there will be another place to go to. I don't know what we will do. I don't know if we will take our children and say, now you're going to stay home and I will teach them, or whether we will have to let them go to the school and come home and do everything we can to bring them to understand that what they're being taught is not true. I don't know. God give us wisdom for that day. That's what we pray for. He'll give us the grace. You give us the wisdom to face it in that day. Obviously, primary and secondary schools are of utmost importance. Oh, Christian College, that's another question on that. Thank you for the great view of our rich history with zeal for Christian education. The past is said to shed light on what's to come in the future. What do you see to be the largest challenge in the future? Probably government intervention. The devil understands what a tremendous power our schools are. I can only just, just to illustrate one thing. The difference that I saw as a minister teaching catechism to the children in the Dune School where I was a minister and later in Hope as compared to teaching catechism in a school in a, in a church, rather, a PR church that did not have its own school. There was a light, light years, a night and day difference. I had to start with the basic information 
in this church which didn't have its own Christian school. But in the other churches, I'm able to build on what the teachers have given them and draw lessons out for them. And they know the, they know the story before I even say it. They'll tell the whole story if they'll let them, the, the catechumen will. That's just one aspect of it, how tremendously important it is to have our own schools. Well, the devil understands that. And he will do his utmost, therefore, to destroy this powerful, powerful tool that God has given to parents to raise their children in the fear of the, of the Lord. There is, of course, the financial squeeze and the government willing to say, we'll give you some money. And that, of course, is a temptation, always has been, to take some government money. We can't quite make it, but if we take government money, no strings attached, we can do it. But again, learn. The future of the school is in doubt. As soon as you say, we can't do it without government money, well then, as soon as the government puts on requirements that you won't live with, your school has to close. If you can't do it without government money, you can't do it, because you will soon lose your school. Those are things that, it seems to me, the past teaches us very clearly, briefly. Here's an interesting question. It says, this might be off topic, but quite often throughout my high school and college education, I dealt with this common attitude that there is not a need for women to put forth great effort to further their education. I am a woman who graduated from college. I see a great importance for it at present. I am a wife and mother. Can you address this at all? I certainly will. And I want to make a confession here. I was of this same opinion. I was of the same opinion. I did not encourage my daughters to go to college. I regret that. I regret that. I see it now in a very different light. If one considers college to be the place that trains you to get a job, well then, okay, don't, don't go to college. Be a wife and a mother. That's the highest calling there is in the world. But if college is intended to develop your mind, to be able to serve God wherever your future is, then go to college. Now again, college isn't for everyone. I'm not saying that. Everybody has to go to college. But if you have the interest and if you have the abilities and you enjoy studying and you want to develop your mind, go to college. Male or female, it doesn't matter because what you're doing is developing your mind and being able, therefore, with that additional development to serve God better. Read the beacon lights and notice some of the ladies that are writing some fine articles and notice they went to college. Not all of them. But God has used that to equip them. That's just one area. That doesn't account what they're doing with their own children. That isn't counting what they can do to encourage others in the, in the churches and other ways they can serve. Developing the mind is a very important thing. To be able to serve God. This is what we want. To be able to serve God the best that I can with the abilities He has given me. If you have an interest in it, I encourage you, parents, I encourage you to encourage your daughters to go to college, very much. Last question, I think. There is one question I honestly do not understand. If I don't get to your question, feel free to talk to me afterwards, but I don't quite understand the question, so I'm gonna skip it, but you can certainly talk to me afterwards. Can we, here's the last question then, can we, and if not, should we consider having our own PR? No, that's not the one. What advice and encouragement do you have for us as a small school working to add the high school grades in 2017? What advice or encouragement do you have for us as we look to having a high school? In the first place, absolutely encouragement. Absolutely encouragement. But at the same time, a warning. There have been Protestant Reformed schools where the supporters of the school said essentially this, the only thing that matters is that it's Protestant Reformed. The quality doesn't really matter. Now they didn't say that in words, 
But that was the attitude. It's PR. It's PR education. That's good enough. That may not be our attitude, just that it's PR. We're training our children's minds. We're training them in a crucial stage in their life when they're starting to open their minds and they need to have their minds opened in a proper way and guided and directed in good ways. That means the instruction must be high quality. Now, high quality doesn't mean merely that we throw as much information at them as possible, but the whole nature of a school involves a teacher. And I... And I I'm wholly in favor of using some other means to supplement some videos or whatever, but you need a teacher there, a teacher who can interact with the students and have opportunity to have true instruction being given and discussions of a classroom nature. That's what makes education live, not merely watching a good video. It's the discussion that goes on. It's the teacher applying it and directing it in a proper way. So your teacher is crucial in this. Teachers at a high school level. You can't think of one person accomplishing all the tasks. If you want somebody just to plug in the computer and hit the button, okay, you only need one person for that. But if you want true teaching to go on, you're going to need people. Now that may mean other people in the congregation. It doesn't mean you have to hire five teachers, but it means the congregation, those who have effort, and maybe this is some mothers who've had a university education. People in the congregation who can contribute to this. Loveland is doing this. Look at what they're doing. I'm sure you have. They're gathering people out of the congregation to teach a course or two. So there's true teaching going on. But you want it to be of the absolute highest quality because you're developing the minds of these covenant youth and equipping them to a life of good works. Protestant reformed, of course, that's the bottom line. But we're not satisfied that it merely meets that requirement. We want a quality education with good teaching, good teaching going on in the school. So absolutely I encourage you, but have a high, high, high goal and recognize this is no inexpensive venture. This is a very, very expensive. I'm not trying to frighten you, absolutely not, but recognize that you can't just do it with one man going around pressing buttons and saying, okay, here's your science lecture, oh, here's your history lesson. There must be some teaching that's happening here. I think it can be done, but that's my warning, that's my encouragement for you as you look to the future. I know the zeal that you have. The first Protestant Reformed school was here, and it's even after it was dissolved and reopened in 75. By the way, I almost took that position offered in 90, or seven, 90, uh, 76, but you didn't offer me the contract. You gave it to John Kelsbeek, which was a much better choice. <laughs> he was experienced, and I was just coming out of college, and uh, he was here for more than four years, so obviously it was the best choice. Uh, but anyway, God bless you in your continued efforts to maintain a good Christian school and the Lord willing, a high school as well. Interesting, instructive, insightful, and inspiring was the speech this afternoon. And we give our hearty thanks to Professor Dykstra. He's busy teaching in the seminary, preaching on Sundays, and doing all kinds of other work, including giving many other speeches this fall. And we're very thankful that you were willing to come and speak to us this afternoon. And thanks to the committee and all those involved in putting together the event this afternoon. Let us now pray. Our Father in heaven, the covenant is thine. Thou hast conceived of it. 
Thou hast established it in Jesus Christ. Thou dost maintain it, and thou wilt perfect it. It is not ours. It is not our conception. We do not establish it. We do not maintain it. We do not perfect it. It is thine. And we earnestly beseech thee, therefore, for the grace to be faithful in our part in thy covenant to render to thee ardent returns of love and to show our gratitude to thee for our place in the covenant by instructing our children. And we pray that the Christian school may be a powerful means to that end in allowing us to fulfill our vows that we make at baptism and to do the calling that is ours as our part in the covenant. And we have heard the heritage of the Reformed churches this afternoon. Lord, inspire us. And as the Reformers themselves so clearly taught, it is not only thy grace that we need to establish schools, but grace to maintain them, to maintain them well and to keep the schools good. Lord, ever preserve us in maintaining the school that thou hast given to us here and according to thy will the establishment of a protestant reformed high school here we put all of our trust and confidence in thee inspire us to be faithful graciously pardon all of our sins and anything we did we did or said or thought in our hearts this afternoon that was displeasing to thee forgive us we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.